Hi, I'm Daryl Urbanski, and welcome to the Best Business Podcast. My mission is to help create 200 new multi-millionaire business owners. How? You'll do better when you know better. In my interviews, you'll hear from self-made millionaires, seven-figure business owners, authors, and world-class experts sharing how they did it so you can too without experiencing the same obstacles they did. When your life and your business grow as a result of what you're about to discover, please call me and tell me about it. The number to leave a voicemail is one 888 844-GROW. That's 1-888-844-4769. Long distance charges may apply. Dial now to call me, connect, share your personal story of how my interviews have helped, or share your current challenges and frustrations so I can connect you with an appropriate course, coach, or help you if you connect. Now, if you like this interview, please share it with a friend you think will benefit. They'll appreciate it, and I will as well. You can also connect with me on social media. Look for Daryl Urbanski, D-A-R-Y-L, Urban Ski, U-R-B-A-N-S-K-I, and add me so we can be friends. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy what I've prepared for you right here, right now. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Daryl Urbanski, your host as always, and today we are joined by Austin Dunham, YouTuber of calisthenics slash street workout tutorials and bodyweight fitness enthusiast. Austin started back when he was an 18-year-old freshman in college. He joined his local ROTC program and was introduced to calisthenics training. After training for a while and getting really good, he decided to start uploading videos to YouTube to show his progress and help others. He now has over 750,000 YouTube subscribers, over 61 million video views, plus a healthy online business based around helping others live healthier lifestyles. I've asked him to join us here today to talk about using social media to reach millions and his experience turning this into a business. So... Austin, thank you so much for joining us today. How you doing, man? Hey, man. Thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Glad to be here. Yeah, it's an honor and pleasure. So now, obviously, this is kind of like you kind of stumbled into this. You didn't like you didn't have to come up with a business plan. There wasn't like you know you didn't go get some seed capital, right? And go all do all this. But mm-hmm. did you do you come from a business background? Do you are you parents entrepreneurs? You know, or yeah, like do you have any business background at all? No, so actually I have no business background. So my parents, my mom has a business degree. She works in corporate business. My dad's in the military. But when it comes to entrepreneurship, I'm like, I'm definitely the first one in my family. But I would say something about myself is that I've always had an entrepreneurial spirit. Ever, ever since a kid, I've always been obsessed with just getting money and figuring out ways to earn money. As a kid online, I used to be a part of these little weird systems on how you do these surveys and all this stuff to make money. And I would all day be on there. And um, and as an 11-year-old, I would get hundreds of dollars a month, which was a, t- a ton to me. So I've always been entrepreneur in that space. But in regards to my background, not really. Got it. So mm-hmm. in putting these videos up online, when did it transition from being a hobby to being a business? Like when did when did you go from just putting up videos and just chatting with people to being like, oh, geez, like they're, you know, I should make a product? Yeah. It, so the first year is pretty much just giving straight value, you know, just helping people out. It was passion, fun, still is passionate and fun. But I kind of discovered through my audience, my audience was asking like email me, emailing me to make them custom workout programs. And at right. first I was doing it for free because I didn't know any better. And, and then I thought about, I was like, you know, I could probably charge a little bit of money for this because I was, it started to take up a lot of my time and I started charging like $20 per one. And that's how it all started off with just creating custom workout programs for people who emailed me. Mm-hmm. And that went well, but obviously that's a lot of active work. So I'm on the emails all day making programs. And I started doing a little bit of market research of people within the fitness space and seeing what they're doing. And I figured out that a lot of businesses where they're making passive income through the their online courses that they have. So after discovering that, that's when I sat down with myself and I was like, I'm going to create a course. I'm not sure what I'm going to call it yet, but I know that I want to do this. So I started doing research on different platforms I can use. What can I actually sell? And by this point, I've been doing YouTube for a little over a year. So I have a pretty established audience. I've given them tons of value. But um, it all started off with those little $20 custom workout programs I used to make. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's an awesome. For, thank you for giving the highlight there. Now, 
with it. And maybe there doesn't need to be any serious grind or toil or, but in terms of like putting content on YouTube, was it just kind of the wild west? Like you were just like you put on YouTube and you just got traction. Did you have to figure out how to optimize your videos or how to get found or anything like that? Were you just sharing it on Facebook? Like how did you get? Because a lot of people are trying struggling to grow their channels, and so I guess that's why I'm trying to ask is, you know, you've yeah. grown so big. Was it just? Did it just kind of just happen? Like right time, right place? You just kind of you know it all just clicked, or did you have to figure things out to get that growth? Yeah. So with YouTube, I've been. I've been making YouTube videos since I was around 12, 13 years old or around multiple topics. I've always enjoyed just creating videos and posting them, sharing them. So going into the fitness thing and sharing my fitness side, I, ha- I kind of had an understanding of YouTube and how it worked. Now in regards to getting traction, uh, my first few videos uh, naturally did well due to the nature of the content. So um, it was a transformation video and I knew that transformation videos within the fitness niche always did well so um, if it's a good transformation and it's motivational you're you're definitely going to get at least 50,000 or plus views on it and then the biggest hit for me in the early stages was my beginner home calisthenics workout routine and that blew up kind of by a total accident now it wasn't a complete accident because with YouTube one thing you got to understand that a lot of people don't understand, especially new people getting in, into the space, is that your titles have to be SEO optimized, which basically means people have to be able to search on YouTube and to find your video. And my video title was Beginner. That's a, that's a keyword right there. Um, beginner Calisthenics Home Workout Routine. So um, I didn't do any like market research on this, but in hindsight, um, those keywords together get a lot of search volume over the months, especially during that time period, which was 2014 or 2015. And uh, I was kind of oblivious to that. So that video just took off very, very well for me, along with the transformation one. And those were like my first three videos, honestly. So that kind of gave me a little kickstart and boost to it. And alongside all that stuff, I was I was seeing – what other people in my space kind of were posting and kind of creating a twist of my own version of that. That really helped out a lot. And also I did used to uh, share within the subreddit, which is like a form of my body weight training subreddit. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. So, all right. So now you've got this growth, you've got this community, you're engaging with them. Now, what have been some of the biggest challenges that you've had to figure out? Like, Looking back where you are now, and I know that we're all still kind of in the middles of our journey, so we all have long ways to go, but where you are now looking back, do you see that there were like milestones where you started figuring things out? Like you mentioned before, like you kind of already talked about, you first it was just uploading videos and kind of chatting, and then you were getting requests from people, so you started doing kind of a lot of one-off. You're like, man, there's a lot of manual work. And then you started finding, oh, I should do a course, and you know, that's more, you know, it's more scalable. Do you figure like, what, can you define just like, the milestones, I guess, as you've been evolving as an entrepreneur and a business owner through here. Like you kind of talked about at least the product, but in terms of a business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, through the milestones, if I can like talk about them, the first one is, you know, realizing that I can make money through my audience, creating the workout programs. And then the next one was realizing what passive income was that I don't have to be actually physically working to make money now and figure out a system behind that. And then through that, I just kept learning little stuff. So now I have to learn what a, what a sales page is and the best way to set up a sales page because at first I did all that by myself. So I had to do a little bit of research behind that, was the best way to you know input this bullet point, you know, just formatting stuff. And then my next milestone was back-end marketing. So setting up an email list, segmenting those lists of different buyers, sending out email automation sequences that lead, take a buyer through like a process or a story that leads them to a sale. Started learning more about that. And still during this time, I'm doing everything by myself to creating the sales pages, setting up email automation sequences on MailChimp at the time, and just everything. And then... At this point in time, I, I started putting myself around more business people or more people in my space who are very business savvy. 
And um, that's when also I got my now business partner along with me. And that's when I started learning more about what a sales funnel is instead of just, you know, a one-off buy. Now I've learned that you can create a sales funnel. You can include upsells, downsells, and just take the buyer through a whole entire process. Starting from something that's even free, that's not even paid, you know, creating these lead magnets and free eBooks. And um, that, that has been probably the biggest game changer in regards to my business now. And I'm not sure if you heard the platform ClickFunnels, but yep. um, that has been a big help with that. Yeah, yeah. ClickFunnels is a good mm-hmm. tool. A lot of people use it. It made it really simplified. It's nothing super new for a lot of people, but it, mm-hmm. it puts everything in one place. What, it did, what they did is they took out, they made it so one person could do it without having learned web design, without having learned how to set up the tracking, all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, exactly. Can we, let's talk about these, because you listed some very, some really important milestones. Let's talk about this. So you said first realizing you can make money. I know how that felt like the first time I got paid. I was like, really? Like, (laughs) I don't know if I, I think everybody Mm -hmm. kind of remembers their first customer. I'm sure you do. Mm -hmm. You said next year to realize what passive income is. Can you just, what is passive income? Yeah. So um, what I've learned passive income is, is basically making money while you're sleeping or not having to do anything while getting getting paid and you know 24 7 making money and that's because you set up a system of some sort and now it makes money for you you put up the hard work up front and now you kind of sit back and you you still gotta maintain it but you don't have to do as much work at all and um what are the components of one of these systems what would you say if someone if you had a little cousin or something or even a child and you had to teach them about these systems what would you say what are the what are the pieces of it uh, pieces of a uh, passive income system? Right. Gotcha. Having something that is that is automatic, so like that can sell to the masses almost. Like it's, it's still personable, but in a way it can be sold to everybody and everybody can get s- some sort of value from it and um, of whatever you're teaching. And I feel like it does help if you do have a skill or you do have something to teach. And then you you set up some type of system where you can get that information out to anybody and anybody can get it. And so that's what makes it uh, passive to me, if, if I can explain that the best way I can. Do you have your own ideas or thoughts about it? Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm just trying to get – so I think what you said there is really good. So first is you have to give value. I love how you started with that. So you have to give value somewhere. You have to have a skill to teach – so for you, that was YouTube. YouTube is a place that 24 hours a day, seven days a week, people can go to YouTube and they can learn from you. And you give away all this ton of free stuff. And it's almost like, you're, you know, it's like there's, there's the five stages of a customer journey, essentially. And that what I mean by that is maybe somebody really needs, like, your program. Maybe they really need your online course to understand the nuances and how to get the most benefits from body weight training in their life. But there's five stages. There's unaware, problem aware, solution aware, product aware, and then most aware. And so when at the beginning, they're kind of unaware, and they just hear about your transformation story, and then they're kind of like, oh, this is kind of neat. And then they're kind of curious, and then they're kind of going through, and they realize, oh, I have a problem. Like, my body's changing, and I don't like the way it's changing. Or I was playing basketball with my friends, and, man, I was so gassed. Or something happens, and they become they realize that they have a problem. And so now they start diving in more and more and more, kind of mm-hmm. like, you know, they know they have an issue but don't know what to do about it. And this is where they would go through your material and start to learn more about like the problems and, and, and start figuring out the solutions like oh you can do this kind of program and that kind of program okay and they look at your channel and the other guy's channel and now they're becoming product aware they're aware of the landscape of who's all out there and then it's they look at the most aware where they know the landscape they know everything that's out there now they're trying to pick the best fit for them whether it's you know they're price buyers or whether they're just affinity buyers they want to buy someone that they resonate with and they you know get along with or opportunistic buyers where there's just a reason why they should buy right now that you've got a special going and you know deals available so they get on that and so i think mm-hmm. what you're saying is that for you in the beginning it was by having this way for people to get educated and it was automated you didn't need to be there and before the internet that was books books were the way that people did that that's part of why yeah. books are such a huge thing right now because that's what people use instead of youtube you know i mean we had vhs tapes and stuff like that but i mean it wasn't as easy as just even before vhs tapes it was books it was i put it all in a book i can print out these books, you know, to, for thousands of copies, send them to people, and that was that. So I love that. And that's even why still today books are still a really powerful way of reaching people and establishing exactly. authority and all that. So you've got this automated way 
to teach, provide value. And then when, what's the next step? How do you like, okay, but teaching isn't giving you the money. Where are you making the money? Where's the money come from? So let me, teaching and providing value is like the, the front page, I would say. Right. And okay. through that, yes, you do help people. They get their problems solved maybe, but mm-hmm. it's that little percentage of the people who want to take it even to the, uh, the next level, you know, have it literally all laid out for them take out the guesswork really, you know what I mean? And cut that learning curve even more so that they don't, they don't have to do a lot of research on their own. And that's where that next tier kind of comes in in, reg- in regards to the, the courses and, and other products available like that. Right. So you mentioned that you had to learn how to set up a sales page. And so sales pages were back in the day. I always use this story to kind of illustrate what a sales page is and how it works. But Back in the day, you know, all business owners were sales reps, essentially. You'd have to face, talk to someone face-to-face and, you know, explain it. Mm-hmm. And one day there's this guy who's trying to make a ton of money. He's got a baby on the way maybe, or maybe his wife wants to go on vacation. They need a bigger house. Who knows what? And he's trying to figure out, how do I knock on more doors in a day? Because beyond the people that would just kind of go by wherever you lived, if you wanted to, you know, if you wanted to, the, the, the phrase itself is, it indicates the, the act, like, drive your business. You have to drive, that means, like, if he wanted to go out and, and actively grow his income instead of just waiting around for people to come to him. He's trying to figure out, how do I knock on more doors in a day? And he realized every time he knocks on a door, he goes through the same spiel. He gives the kind of same pitch. He realized if I write this down on a letter, I can actually, this is before the post office, you know, before I can go to a town, I can pay boys, like little young kids, to go deliver my letters for me. And then I come around and I'll just answer questions and, and collect money. And then at some point he realizes that some of these people he's going to, they're already ready to buy. They just give him the money and go. And so now he figures out that, hey, you know, I can just pull into a town. I had a little order form in my letter. I answer, add all these frequently asked questions to my letter as well to kind of cover everything I've talked to people about. Now these kids just go distribute the letter to the neighborhood, come back with the order and the money, and I give the kid the product and they go deliver it, right? And so that's kind of how that, and then Mm -hmm. now we have the postal system. That developed uh, direct response mail, which is really that's internet marketing like that's the, the or original, that's the OG of internet marketing. Like, you know, that's where it all kind of came from. So yep. a sales page is what you said. A sales page is a way to put your, your face-to-face, kneecap to kneecap, belly-to-belly sales presentation onto a page that it's in a logical order. It, you know, includes all the things that maybe people want to see, like testimonials and stuff like that. But you always start off with testimonials, right? It's got to happen when they, like there's a progression of like, of what people want to go through. Now, you talked about... Two other things I want to ask you about, the back-end marketing and telling stories to sell. Can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Yeah, the back-end or, tell, or telling stories or kind of tying in both? Well, well, both, both. I mean, if they tie in together, great, but those are two, two things I want to ask yeah. you about. So, yeah. Yeah, in regards to the, the back-end marketing, the way I, I personally have it set up is, you know, like I brought up before, is using um, different sales funnels in place for for the different content so let's say so now i have multiple back-end services or programs that are set up for people who ha- want different goals so one is somebody who wants to gain muscle with body weight training the next one is somebody who wants to get you know a very strong weighted pull-up so the free content i create might be around the weighted pull-up stuff and then from there for the people who want to learn more i take them to either a deal or a free offer at least them um, to the front of the sales funnel, which immediately puts them in the back end. So I, now I have their email and they're put on a list. And through that sales funnel, they might get taken to a VSL where through, like you said before, storytelling, usually within the VSL, I do some type of storytelling where I, where I talk about how I'm able to learn what I've learned or how I progress through this amount of years and how I got to where I'm at now, tell them about my, my struggles and how I was able to overcome it and what I was able to learn and how now you can learn what I know. And, um, I, you know, even quicker than I did because I have all the information out here for you. And, um, that has been a uh, really successful. It's, it's the same reason why the transformation videos do so well with fitness. It's because it tells a story of some of my struggles and how they turned into a superhero. And that's super motivational for people. Mm, mm, I love that. Yeah, I love that. So, one of the things that you said is that you back end is you segment people based on the problem that they're trying to solve, which I love that. Gary Bensavega is one of the world's greatest living copywriters, and in terms of sales, he's just crushed anybody else's record out there. 
And he used to say that problems are market, not demographics, not psychographics, but problems are market. So everyone's sort of revolved, and so you just talked about your back end is divided by the specific problem they're trying to solve. A VSL, for those that know, don't know, is called a video sales letter. So the idea is that your face-to-face kneecap to kneecap presentation that you would do one-on-one with someone is something that you could transcribe into a letter, and you could also use as a script to create a video around and for. And so these are all just different formats to deliver. And you could actually plot on a scale, believe it or not, if you had the, like, let's say we took you, Austin, and you were face-to-face, kneecap to kneecap with one of your, your subscribers trying to pitch them on your course or program, you might convert 7 out of 10, you know, or whatever, 8 out of 10, 10 out of 10, 6 out of 10, whatever that conversion rate is, you could almost plot on a regressing chart that face-to-face, kneecap to kneecap, you convert this many, but if you did it over a webinar, you convert a little less. If you did it over the phone, you convert a little less. If you did it through a video, you convert a little less. And if you did it with text and images on a web page, you convert even less. You know, but there, there are different levels of scalability where you can't talk to 100,000 people one-on-one, but you can't have 100,000 people go watch your video sales letter, right? So just exactly. to yep. there, listen to how that works. So yeah, and the stories. I love that. I love that. Okay, so. We talked about what passive income is, we talked about sales pages, we talked about back end marketing and segmenting people and telling stories. How do you fit in the upsells and downsells and cross sells? Is that all at the time that they're buying? Is that later in the day? Like do you have a strategy for that? Actually, no, it's so is is as the the buyer or the customer is going through whatever that you're getting. So let's say they, they get a, a free ebook. Sometimes immediately after they get the free ebook they get taken to a page where it's some type of special offer. You, uh, you know what a, a tripwire offer is? You heard yeah, the, I'm sure the digital, you, yeah. Digital marketer, yeah, it's, it's a front-end offer. A digital marketer want, coined the term tripwire, which is like a $7 to probably under 20 or 30 bucks. anything that's like you know a dollar to $30. Exactly. So they might be taken to some type of tripwire offer or sell. It depends on the funnel. And um, from there, let's say they get that that little, you know, $8 mini program, mini ab course or something. And then from there, it, like sometimes Im- immediately after on the on the um, funnel, it takes them now to an upsell of whatever they just got or may- like maybe a full version of that or is- or something that relates to it of some sort. It, it takes some thinking to-, to figure out what exactly you should provide to the person so that it makes sense. But another example I can give you is with my Bodyweight Body Better program, they're taking, once they get the program, they're taken to an upsell to get like a dieting program that explains, Mm. lays out all of nutrition for them because with working out, it goes hand in hand with nutrition. So it only makes sense, right? And Mm. and that does actually really well because of that reason. So um, it it depends on... um, what you sell now in regards to down sales, I, I didn't know about this at all. You know, when somebody rejects the offer, you know, they get taken to now a page where you can still get this offer, but now I, I feel like you really need this, and I'm gonna give it to you at an even bigger discount just because I feel like it's gonna help you out this much, even though you said no the first time. So, it, and then. You know, whatever the statistics are for that, maybe 60% of people say no, 60% say yes, but that's just another way to, you know, I guess, get the, get the customer to, to get your stuff, you know. Mm-hmm. It's really, really useful, and I, and I had no clue that that existed or that you could do that. It's almost like being a salesperson online automatically, yeah. but you're not in person. It's, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah, well, that's, that's all this is. I love that you brought that up because, you know, I'm, I'm a bit older than you, but that's, uh, you know, I, w- I grew up when compu- before the Internet was around, but computers were, computers were there, but the Internet wasn't when I, was a ki- when I was a kid. And that's all it really is. Like all this stuff, social media, all this, all this stuff, it's all just a mirror of the physical world, but online. And that all this stuff, like when you talk about a sales funnel, all a sales funnel is, like if you're talking like a, in a real-time sales funnel, so is real-time meaning I, I'm going through the checkout process, it's exactly like you said. It's like what you would do in person, right? In person, you'd be like, hey, you want to get this? It's 50 bucks. And they're like, well, I don't, look, I know you're hesitant from the price, so you know, I'll take out my commission or whatever. Like, I can give you this discount, but I really think you need it because 
this is why, here's the reason, blah, blah, blah. And that's what you just put on the web page. And so it's like, again, it's just modeling the real world. It's all based around that. I don't know if you realize this or not, but even though you built your business very organically, it's such a phenomenal way to grow a business because it's not, you're not trying to predict things. You're just, like, here's a, a story. When I was, I lived in Japan for three years, and there's a story mm -hmm. of, I don't know if this is one of those stories everybody's got a different version of, but I was told by a friend a story of how they expanded Tokyo University campus. So Tokyo is uh, in Japan, and Japan is an island nation, so land there is incredibly valuable. People often buy and sell buildings, but people do not often buy and sell land. They hold on to it because there's, not, there's no more, right? <laughs> They're not, not making any more of it. So uh, mm -hmm. it was a big deal that the Tokyo University extended their campus and bought more land. And so... There was a project manager who had the blueprints for the buildings and everything, and there was a site manager who was managing the construction workers and the teams of people. And they'd been building the exteriors of all the new buildings. And then uh, the, they pulled out all the big tr vehicles, all the big machinery, and the site manager went to the project manager saying, hey, winter's coming. Where do you want the landscaping? I've got the blueprints for the building, but I don't know where you want the parking lot to be. I don't know where the sidewalk should be, where the fount water fountain should be, where should all this stuff be? And the project manager said, you know what, let's just wait. And they kind of got into an argument because the site manager was like, no, like, let's do it now. Everybody's here. Let's do it. Like, let's just do it. Just tell me where you want it. And the site project manager said, no, no, let's wait. Let's just get the inside of the buildings done so they can use them in the school year. So that's what they did. So school opens up, kids all come to the campus, they're using the normal campus, right, all this stuff. And then when spring came and the ground was soft, when they went to come back and build the parking lot and the sidewalks, they didn't need blueprints because people parked where they wanted to park. There were walking paths from one door to another. They could tell which paths were more used, like, more frequently, which paths need to be bigger, where people kind of naturally kind of were hanging out outside, and then they kind of just made, like, a, a park area there. They didn't need blueprints. They just built to fit the people. And you've kind of done that. Like, you've really uh, – there's a lot of people that try to start online businesses, and they struggle – because they set up a page that's supposed to be a sales page and it doesn't convert, and they're just sitting there kind of scratching their head trying to figure out why someone didn't buy. But what you did is that you were just uploading content and then you were engaging and connecting with people and talking to them, and they were asking you for these programs and stuff. So you were actually face-to-face -face selling them. So then when you went and you started building these systems like sales pages and that, you actually are drawing on that past experience that you have. Mm -hmm. like you're not creating anything. You're not trying to figure any of that out. You're just translating what you learn face-to-face, kneecap to kneecap into this digital medium, if that makes sense. And then like, yeah, said, it like, actually does. The, yeah. Yeah. And that's where, and just as a little, like a heads up to you, if you go ever to start a new business, be careful if you're not doing it that organic path, because you know, you might end up fine feeling like a lot of us, even myself have had to have, have fallen to the, everything I touch turns to gold. Like, you know, I did this and I did a couple million, I did that, I did a couple million, I know what I'm doing. And then you start going and you think you can, you just think you're smarter than you, you know, than you really are. And you just got to watch out mm -hmm. for that. So. Now, that leads to my next question, which I was going to ask. If you, if anyone's listening to this and they're struggling or they're just starting out and they're looking to get going, whether it's with YouTube or something else, what would you do if you had to start all over? Or what would you recommend to someone in that scenario? Yeah, if uh, one if I had to start all over, or to a somebody who's a beginner and is wanting to start, I would say one, uh, is make sure that I'm passionate about whatever I'm doing. Uh, so me personally, I I tend to get up, literally obsessed with things like uh, with hobbies or whatever I'm I'm learning because I just want to be that good at it. So fitness was and calisthenics and body weight training was no excuse for that either, and also YouTube. So. Just make sure you're really passionate about it and through passion comes with consistency because if you're not passionate about it then eventually you're going to end up quitting and the biggest factor with YouTube is literally just to keep posting videos I feel like anybody can get traction off YouTube in due time as long as they're consistent no doubt about it as long as you're consistent you have passion and also you know it, whatever you're talking about and or you're skilled in whatever you're talking about or you're just simply entertaining have any of those three, which it might take a bit of time because when I first started making videos, I wasn't like an, an expert like I am now at body weight training. <laughs> it, was, it was more the lines of docu documentation and motivating other people and that came off really relatable in a sense because people saw me being able to do 10 pull-ups last month, now I can do you know 15 to 20. And then over time, as the years went on, I became an expert. And now people look up to me and, and inspired to be like me in that sense. So 
that was quite a bit, but if I have to condense it down, passion, consistency, and, um, and be skilled or motivational or have, have a, figure out your reason as to why people will want to follow you and why people look up to you. And if you can easily answer that, then it shouldn't be an issue. Mm, I love that. All right. So be passionate about it. Be obsessed. Be consistent and know why. And I think that comes back to that problem. What's the problem you're going to help people solve? What would people, mm-hmm. right? What are they going to learn from that? What are some of the greatest mistakes you see other people on YouTube or even some of your friends making in terms of like with their business? Um, I would, I would definitely say, like I said, consistency. Like I, I, I that's always the answer to the, the questions, but it's always the issue. Um, a lot of my friends have wanted, have wanted to start YouTube channels or, Maybe they started, and maybe they were getting some traction, but they kind of fall off for whatever reason. Like, they're not doing anything at all, and they, they stop posting or whatever the reason is, and it all goes downhill after that. And they get back to it, and they figure out why, you know, people forgot about them, or they lost traction, or it's not doing as well as it used to. It's because you didn't keep up with the, the consistency, you know? Yeah, it's... In regards to my my friends and what I see through other people with YouTube, that has to be the biggest thing is Mm. literally just sticking to a schedule and doing it, making no excuses for yourself. Now, you can schedule your uploads in that too, can't you? You can schedule this stuff or do you have to manually upload it one by one um, even if you've created a bunch of content? Or can can I go to YouTube and upload a bunch of stuff and, and put it in a calendar for when I want it to be released? Yeah, you actually can. I'm not sure when they came out that feature. I feel like it's been there for like years now. But you can upload a whole bunch of videos, schedule each one for next Sunday, the Sunday after that, Sunday after that. If you did did batch your content in that style like that, um, I tend to do like just manuals. So say Sunday, I'm, let me go upload a video, you know. But mm. teach your own. Got it. So, so we're talking about consistency. So people could even do things in batches. Like if they have an issue with consistency, they could just create a bunch oh, yeah. of content put it in a scheduler and they could have the next three months, six months, whatever. Now, would you recommend that or do you pivot in when you're creating your content? Are you like, how do you know what to make? I mean, at this point you've been doing it for years. Haven't you run out of things to make videos about? Like, do you ever feel like you're repeating yourself at this point or what? Yeah. So when, when it comes to fitness, you do have to eventually diversify yourself. Like I start small, I start in a niche and I used to make completely only body weight calisthenics content. And then over time, once you talked about about everything, and by the time you should have some sort of a following, that's when you can diversify a little bit. You know, you can talk about things relating to your niche, but it doesn't have to be exactly about it. So I still talk about stuff within the fitness space. Maybe now I'll talk about more about a little bit of diet stuff. I show more of my lifestyle, like what I'm eating today or what my training is looking like and how I'm progressing or little things. I have a lot of shower thoughts or when I'm working out, I just think of stuff like, oh, that would be a good video idea. And I keep a, a video idea note to my, in my iPhone. Then along now, with that... Sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Go ahead. Sorry. I didn't, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, you're good. I, 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 I was just going to say, along with keeping the, um, video notes, um, I read comments. I even ask my audience like on Instagram what videos they want to see. And I, I have a content calendar that I plan 30 days out in advance every single month. So I, I know what, what exactly is going to be posted on YouTube up until October right now. Right, right, right. That's awesome. I was going to say relevancy of your channel. You said you have to diversify. I've heard different things from different people. I've had some people say I had two, three channels, each on a different topic, but now I really feel like I should have just kept it to one. What what are your thoughts on that? Like you say, like you you post different about different things sometimes. What what would you recommend? Would you recommend somebody like if I'm big on diet but I'm also big on something else? Would I would you recommend just putting them into one channel or should I have two separate channels for both interests? I feel like when you're starting off, you should pick one niche, one interest, whatever you're most passionate about, whatever you have the most knowledge about, and start on that. So let's say, for example, in the business world, you're really good at email marketing tactics. So I would make videos around email marketing and and talk about that as much as you can for as long as you can. And then once once you got some sort of traction or whatever, 
that's when you can diversify, but not diversify into a totally different niche or topic. You just stay on the realm of whatever you're talking about. So instead of email marketing, now you can talk about different lead generation tactics, you know, or something around that nature. You don't completely come out of your niche. You just make content kind of around it. But you always start off with something that people know you for, that you're strong suit. And that's why I'm known as the calisthenics or bodyweight fitness guys because that's all I posted about for like a, a year and a half. And then over time, I started showing more of my personality. I started sharing more things uh, besides just, you know, bodyweight training. But that's still mm. like my main thing. Right, 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 right. Got it, got it, got it. So now you talked about how you've got this kind of passive income coming in, which is fantastic. You put up your content, the web pages do what they do. You kind of can live your life. But would you still believe, like, what your, which kind of your habits or routines that you feel you and maybe the more successful people you know on YouTube have? You also already mentioned consistency. How does that translate? Because a lot of people are like, oh, I love passive income. I just spend my day doing what I really love, right? Spend my day at the beaches, right? You know, do something else. How does that tie in? Like now that you're able to make money without having to show up for a nine to five job, do you just mm -hmm. not work? Like you know, like do you know what I mean? Like how does that? Yeah. What would, you, what would you say to that? Yeah. So me myself, I, even though I'm doing well and is it has been a while, I haven't got gotten complacent in my business at all. I've been planning out in regards to what am I releasing next, or how can I make this better? How can we scale this up? But for the past year, is has really been like kind of launch after launch. So I, I launched this program. Even though I launched this program, now I'm I'm working on the next one because I'm just trying to build my kind of resume or library of items I can provide to people. And so the the next thing I'm working on now is you know an app. So even though you know I, I still make passive income, I, I st I'm always working on something. Is basically what I'm trying to say. And then if it gets to a point of where I'm not working on something, then it's all about how to make what we have now even better and do more, you yeah. know. And then at the end of the day, I still have content to create and trying to make that better. So I'm always working. I always have stuff to do. I'm never complacent in that sense. I love that. I love that. This, this actually reminds me, I, I actually wrote a book. I've never released this book, but I wrote this book called Tribal Marketing, How to Double Your Business in 12 Months or Less. And I've never released it. I'm probably going to release it sometime. I actually just finished another book. So I have five books now, but only three have been released. Wow. You but in it, I was talking it. about, yeah, I know, I know, I know. Well, I'll talk, my biggest problem is I help so many people with their businesses that I end up not spending enough time on mine as if I were to build my own thing. But it's okay. I'm, I'm looking for more equity deals. So that's. That's my solution for that. And part of it is because I love client work because, I, like, I have OCD, like, in the sense of, like, when I first started learning all this stuff, I was applying it to my martial arts school. But, I, you know, I really love mastering things. Like, I'm a huge, like, for example, we talked about face-to-face -face sales and that. I felt like I'd been doing stuff online and doing stuff for other people that I hadn't really been doing a lot of sales. So this year I've gone through three or four programs about like sales, face to, like phone sales and building sales teams and that. I just love mastering things. And so when I was doing my, because I guess my martial arts background maybe, and when I had my martial arts school, I was learning so much about how to grow my school. I was having great, phenomenal results. But it was like I, you know, I only had one or two or three problems. And there's just, you know, and sometimes when you're trying to tackle a problem, there's just the amount of time and energy it takes, you know. So at the end of the day, mm -hmm. it's like, like I can't, I know, like I know how to solve 101 problems, but I'm only dealing with my three and I've got all this knowledge and I want, you know what I mean? And I want to work that muscle. So that's partially how I got into business coaching and consulting was because I was volunteering and just helping out anybody and everybody that I could that had a problem. I was up like Friday nights and my buddies would be like, come to the club. I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'll be there later. And I'd get on a call with a friend, you know, be like, all right, let's talk about how to fix this problem in your business. You know, I'm just doing it for free in the beginning because I just, exactly, I wanted, yeah. like, I felt like the skill set was my, like, I almost felt like, you know, better than a retirement savings fund like developing my skills was the best, and you know, and so anyways, that's, that's how that goes. So, geez, what a big rant I just went on. I totally, I don't know why I'm forgetting my train of thought. That's twice today. Um, <laughs> oh, oh, right. There's the four different levels. So there are four different types of businesses. So there's, I'm going to talk about these two different things. So one was the four different types of businesses. So I spent nine weeks in Africa 
a bunch of years back. And while I was there, whenever you travel, like I've lived in Japan and in, in the Philippines and Thailand and now I'm in Vietnam and you know, I've been in the States and Canada, I've been in New Zealand, Australia, and anytime you live in a different culture, it's, you almost get to, it's like you see things through a cultural lens, like you don't know what you just take for granted because it's always been there. But when you go and you put yourself in a different place, you start to see some of these paradigms that you have or like a lens that you see the world through that is not maybe real. It's a cultural lens. And one of the things when I was in Africa that really jumped out at me, I felt like there were four levels of society in terms of like economic status. And so the, the bottom level was, regrettably, there are times often really like drug and alcohol dependent, low skill, low education, low motivation, pick, pick your poison. It was one of those and they just didn't really do a lot and they had a really struggle, like a, a really tough life. The next level up to, in Africa, at least where I was, Kenya and Uganda, were people who had jobs and they did better and they had like, you know, they could live and had food and that. But for them, life was still really tough because especially where I was in Uganda, you know, there'd be like 3,000 people that could like for uh, quali qualified people for any one job. So there was no job security. Wages were not as high as you'd love them to be, right? It was really tough. There, there was no leverage over the employer. You were really at the whim of, you know, basically doing what the employer wanted and working yourself to death. And you were, you weren't making a great wage because at any time they'd get rid of you and go hire one of those other 3,000 people. But they were the second right. level up. The third level up were people who were self-employed. And so, like, when I was in Uganda, I used to call them Boda Boda drivers. And these were guys that drove uh, motorbikes and dirt bikes because they couldn't afford a whole car. We're talking, like, you know, rural Africa. But so they had a dirt bike. So you just hop on the bike and they'd whip you to where you want. That was their taxi. And these guys, they, could, they were more in control and they could go and uh, make what they wanted to make. But it was the idea that if they didn't go and make what they – like, if they weren't working, they didn't make money. If they had an accident, they couldn't make any money. Right, and so that was the third level. They did better than the people that had jobs, but there was still like some uncertainty involved. And the people who did the best were the people who provided opportunities for others. And this is a very much an offline world analogy because digital. I, that's why I want to talk about the second one as well because I think it's a little different with the digital world. But at least this, they provide opportunities for others. So the example here is the guy who owns and maintains a fleet of these dirt bikes and provides training on how to do it. And that way, now he's, in, like, he's enabling others because maybe somebody would want to drive one of these Boda Bodas but doesn't have the money for a dirt bike or has never done it or doesn't know how to do it or doesn't know like, reasons why someone might be pissed off about you know, working with them. And so instead he provides training for that and he provides the fleet where he rents them out type thing. And so now he has a level of security, though, because it's almost like layers of defense, like an onion. Like before he would have no income, all those Boda Boda drivers would have to be out of, out of work. So that was the way he enabled himself. And so they were like the highest pe level of people that I found that. And you can even think of it like as a franchise, right? Like one location versus if you are supporting 20 people, right, in 20 locations, right? Like all those 20 locations have to fail before you have to you lose your income. So that was that. Now, the flip side of that is I also noticed that there are kind of four types of businesses. So we've got hunters. Well, first we'll talk about uh, gatherers. So hunters and gatherers, everybody knows those, right? And a gatherer was like an employee. A gatherer goes to an office building, they go to this place, they find a tree that bears fruit, and they go, and some days there's more fruit, some days there's less fruit, right? Sometimes you get overtime pay, sometimes you, your hours are cut, right? Sometimes you get a little bonus, like, oh, I got a paid vacation, right? But that's like the gatherer. They go to the tree and they gather the berries that are there, right? That's the gatherer. The hunter is, again, like the Boda Boda driver. They're the hunter. They go look for that buffalo. They look for that big kill. They kill it and then they drag it back and then they chop it up. But then there can be like a feast famine thing because while, while they're eating and, and, you know, they're not hunting at the same time. But I realized mm -hmm. that what allowed us as a society, as a species to really evolve, where we evolved into two other fields as well. And one was farmers and the other one was trappers. And so the farmers were the ones that, you know, they would they would nurture a plot of land and they would fertilize it and they would tend to it and they would clear out the parasites and they would select and choose better strains. And that's kind of like when you talk about the email list. Like you've got this email list and you're nurturing it, you're pruning it. You know, this is from real estate. Realtors used to pick neighborhoods and they would farm that neighborhood by going and creating relationships. They would knock on all the doors and meet everybody and shake the hand. They would have a barbecue party in the park just to get to know everybody. They would have a print newsletter that they would deliver to everybody. That way, when people were ready to buy or sell a home, they would feel more comfortable. They would know, like, and trust them and come to them. So they would farm neighborhoods that way for business. And that's from realtors. They developed that kind of, that kind of approach. But then the other one, and this is part of why I reminded me, it was the trappers. And so this kind of talk comes, 
this is the one where you you kind of set up a, a money trap. You used to call it passive income, but it's really kind mm-hmm. of like a money trap in terms of a trapper would find out paths that animals like a game trail. Okay, like every day there's this trail seems to be you know about the size of a deer. This must be a deer trail, and they would set up traps on these different trails. And then instead of having to be a hunter or a gatherer, they would just have to maintain the traps. But at any given time, the herd might move or migrate, so you constantly need to be looking and setting up new traps. And that's like what you're talking about a lot of your time. Even though you've got these systems set up in place and the maintenance is kind of minimal, you're constantly focused on R&D. And that's what they call it in the business world, research and development, because the world is growing and changing and evolving, and you have to be focused on research and development because things that are working today, like now it's Facebook. Before it was MySpace. Do you know what I mean? If you go to archive.org, archive.org, the website, you put in YouTube and you go back to the very beginning, YouTube started off as a dating site. YouTube. It was oh, wow. Your video. Yeah, if you put it there, it's like, I am a blank looking for a blank between the ages of blank. Like, that was drop-down field. I am a male looking for a female between, 20, you know, 18 and whatever. Mm-hmm. Like that, And that was how YouTube started. But that wasn't what people, you know, and of course you look at how it's evolved till, to now. So, anyway supposed to be your interview but i wanted to share that because you kind of the way you were no, talking that was true. yeah i felt like it, it kind of fed into that and I've, I've never really shared that with a lot of people i put it in a book and i haven't launched those books yet so i mean that's planned for later this year but i thought i'd share that here so i'm about to read that one for sure man you got a <laughs> lot of knowledge there thanks man so where do you see the mm-hmm. future of everything going talking about this like you're developing an app and everything where do you see the future of youtube and the future of kind of these online businesses like like that you're involved in. Yeah, so I, I feel like the so we kind of describe people who do what I do. Besides business owner classification, it, they kind of describe us as influencers, uh, quote unquote, right? So you had different influencers in different niches, just fitness influencers, beauty, fashion, and uh, it's it's really the start, and it's very very new. You know, like two three years ago. It was definitely wasn't as popular, but nowadays it's like super, super popular. And in regards to YouTube and the future of it, uh, I've read something that said like it's only going to get more popular because millions upon millions and millions of people every single year discover YouTube and start watching YouTube. There's more creators being yeah, that are getting on YouTube now, creating videos. So a lot of people think like, oh, I have no chance of you know, competing within the space if I want to create, make videos. And I'm like, no, you have no idea. YouTube is gigantic. Like, and plus there's billions of people who watch YouTube. Like, you, even if you, even if you found 50,000 people to watch your videos, that is mega tiny compared to, you know, what is possible. So I feel like it's only getting more and more popular every year. And online business is just, just going to keep growing, in my opinion. That's how I feel like it's taken because, like I said, everything is so new. And um, things will evolve to where they're supposed to be or maybe things will change a little bit. New services or systems, platforms will come out over the years. But that's where it's for us as uh, business owners and influencers, like I said, to adapt to whatever the change is. So if YouTube goes away, now there's – some random video platform that's becoming super popular, everybody, we're going to get on that one now and do the same exact thing on there. So that's my idea and take on it. Yeah, no, I love it. I love it. I love it. So now, um, what do you feel? I guess you kind of already hinted at this, but what are the most effective or productive means of generating traffic for you? Like now you've got to create these videos. Are you focused on just the questions people ask, or do you always try to lean towards creating type? Like you talked about transformational videos are really powerful. Are you trying to get a lot of those from your customers and buyers and put those on your channel? Then, you know, like is there a hierarchy of kinds of content? Yeah, so you have your different style of content that attracts certain people and that do certain different things for whatever you're trying to do. Um, in short, you have evergreen content. This is content to where somebody can search on YouTube and the information will always be good. So, you know, how to get, how to do more pull-ups, how to, how to do a one-arm pull-up tutorial, you know, stuff like that. And then you have your more personal or subscriber based content stuff that isn't really meant to be found, but more to nourish, nourish the audience that you already have. So, um, what I, what I eat in a day to lose weight for my upcoming competition or that could be evergreen too when you think about it or, um, 
my my morning routine, you know, stuff stuff like that. But uh, if you really want to grow a channel, and what I'm starting to focus more now is the evergreen content. And then when it comes to fitness, you can dive even below beneath that, and it's a it's a beginner content. So but with any niche, the beginner market is absolutely gigantic. And if you create content around helping beginners out, um, I feel like that can also be a little hack to really mm. help out people's channels. So yeah. I'm gonna start focusing more on be- beginner stuff too. Yeah, I love that. I really that my big aha on that was when I was had martial arts and we would go to tournaments and I would see there'd be like 500 white belts competing, there'd be 300 blue belts competing, there'd be maybe 50 purple belts competing, there'd be maybe 10 brown belts competing, and then there'd be maybe two black belts. So I love that because yeah, there's always churn in the market. That's a great tip. Evergreen and beginner content. That's that's really where it's at. That's really, really, really where it's at. Those are fantastic tips. So mm-hmm. good on you. Um, exactly. So for people that want to find out your channel and all that, like where are you online? How do people reach out to you? How do they get involved? Yeah, so if you're interested in learning more about me and what I do, or maybe you're interested in bodyweight training, uh, my name is Austin Dunham, like Dunham. And if you search on YouTube, Google, anywhere, um, you'll see everything pop up, YouTube, Instagram, all that stuff. Yeah, that's awesome. And then his website as well is workoutad.com. So workout Austin Dunham, workoutad.com. Go check that out. Uh, Austin, this is a great call. You gave a ton of great value, and your personal story I think is really inspiring for a lot of people, and I think it highlights a lot of really important things. People may want to listen to this more than once. Is there anything I didn't ask you that I should have asked you? Um, hmm, great question. Let me think about that. In five, four... Um, no, you asked about, um, future plans, what I see and, and how I keep things. No, nah, I think you did a good job, man. Based on my memory right now. Yeah, all good. All good, man. Well, awesome. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank you for joining us. Cause I know you have your own followers, your own fans and your own life. Um, so thank you for coming and sharing with us to help inspire some of my people. Appreciate you, man. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for having me again. Man. You've reached the end of our interview. Now first, let me thank you for listening. I appreciate and respect you more than you'll ever know. And now I'd like to ask you a couple of questions. First, what three lessons did you just learn? What three aha moments just jumped out at you? Second, what can you implement for yourself and your business in the next 24 hours? Third, what can you give to someone else to help you with or give them to just do it for you? Whatever it is, remember taking action is the secret sauce to results. Now, if you think this interview would be helpful for a friend, please give them a link to it. It'll help them and it'll help me too. I'd also like to invite you to help me find out more about the challenges you're facing, your dreams, your goals, and how I can help you overcome what's holding you back. We both do better when we know better, and your success is my success. So please reach out and interact. You can visit our website bestbusinesscoach.ca for Canada or California, where I'm from and where I'm living. You're welcome to also try out one of our paid programs. You can find us on YouTube, Facebook, and pretty much every other social media channel you can think of. You should also subscribe to the podcast. And if you're enjoying them, please leave us a nice review. It really helps. That's all for now. Once again, thank you. Take care of yourself. And remember, the world needs the best business you can build. And I believe in you.